does your character ruin the campaign? This week, we talk about a few different types of characters we've all seen, but we never want to play with again. Hello players and GMs, I am Reese, and welcome to another video by Jetpack7. Before we get started today, I just wanted to thank everyone who has been commenting on our videos. Whether you agree or disagree with me, your thoughts really do help me out. I've already gotten a few video ideas from some of the recent comments, so thank you all so much to all of you commenters out there who have been helping us out. The past few weeks, I've been having a bunch of discussions with my friends about types of characters we don't like to see in our games. These are usually characters that have kind of become tropes within the D&D community, so for this week's video, I am going to take a look at some of these characters and talk a little bit about why they might exist and how you can hopefully avoid playing with one or worse, playing one yourself. The first character we're going to start off with is a classic, one we've all seen and heard of and maybe the most commonly talked about character throughout the D&D community, the Murder Hobo. For those unfamiliar, the Murder Hobo is exactly what it sounds like. A character that has no home, probably no backstory, nothing interesting really about them other than the fact that they kill every single thing that they come across. That includes NPCs that weren't being aggressive or combative or whatever. Anybody who has played with a murder hobo knows that this character is just the worst. They disrupt the game so much because oftentimes they end up killing people that the GM planned to be important. Anytime they can't just immediately get their way, they start attacking whoever they need to attack to succeed. Need an item from a shop? Kill the shopkeeper. Stubborn door guard not just letting you into the base? Just kill them. An NPC made a joke at your expense? Kill them too. It is a boring style of gaming. It prevents roleplay and can cause a lot of frustration at the table. So why do people do it? I have found that when players become destructive in a campaign, it is because they simply aren't invested in what's happening. Maybe the world doesn't feel real to them, or they really just don't care about whatever plot lines may be happening around them. The best way to deal with a murder hobo as a GM, in my experience, is to try and connect them to the world you've created. Give them some stakes. If they feel like they have something to lose, or that the world they're destroying is actually a living, breathing organism, then they won't feel as inclined to burn everything down. Work with that player on developing a backstory that will help them to feel like they're a part of the world, rather than the only living piece in an otherwise non-living puzzle. If you do that, I'd be willing to bet that their destructive hurricane at least slows down to a slight deadly trickle. The next character is one I've seen in a few different settings. Sometimes it's done well, but most times... It isn't. I call this character, Cat Got Your Tongue. As you probably guessed, this is the character that can't speak. A classic trope we've seen in countless shows, movies, and books, and one that we are often tempted to recreate in a tabletop setting, but when put in practice, we find that there are some issues we come across in this setting that we don't have in other mediums. Namely, talking is very important in D&D. Communication with the party is a vital part of the game, and when you create a character that is lacking the main form of communication, it can not only be inconvenient, it can cause actual, genuine, real-life frustration. The only times I've seen this trope actually work is when the character also takes the message cantrip, which allows for a sort of telepathic communication. Some may argue that the spell doesn't really work this way, but again, that is just another rule bending that you have to do to compensate for the fact that the character can't speak. What usually ends up happening is the player just ends up saying what their character is trying to say through sign or writing or whatever, and at that point you might as well have just spoken it in character. So as you can see, there are a lot of hurdles that we have to get over just to interact with a character who can't speak. From what I can tell, the reason people do this a lot of the time is that they're uncomfortable with roleplay. The player often does not feel comfortable communicating in character, so forcing your character to be a mute is a very tempting way around that roadblock. If this is the case for you, I highly encourage you to just give roleplay a shot. It may feel awkward at first, but I can guarantee you that it will feel more natural as the game goes on. You'll probably already feel better about it within a single session. I know some people have concerns because they can't do crazy voices or dialects or something, but trust me when I say that is totally unnecessary. I play with a group of actors, and though most of us do like to add dialects or voices to our characters, many of us don't, and nobody even really notices. I've played with people who feel more comfortable kind of narrating out what their character does rather than speaking in person, and that's totally okay. But having a character that can't communicate with the party verbally can be a bit of a roadblock that causes some frustration amongst the group, so I encourage people to steer clear of that option if they are given the opportunity. The next character I've seen that can be pretty frustrating to deal with is one that I call the Lone Wolf. Pretty straightforward one here. This is the character that always wants to do things by themselves. 
They eat alone, they drink alone, they wander into the woods at night and sleep alone, and most frustratingly of all, they play alone. The lone wolf is kind of a more specific type of the edgelord trope we see all the time. Not only do they always have their hood up, their face shrouded in the shadows, they also tend to run off and do their own stories separate from that of the party. This can be extremely frustrating because not only does it alienate them from the party, it takes the focus of the session off the group and puts it on one individual. Even if it is just a little bit of time, having to constantly switch from party to lone wolf to party and back to lone wolf can be really irritating as a DM and as a player. We really want to be able to focus on the group while we're playing and the lone wolf frankly makes that very difficult. I think the issue with the lone wolf is that many times a character with a troubled past would logically have trouble connecting with other characters, especially ones they barely know. Now it makes sense logically and psychologically, but as we all know, D&D ain't logical. If you find yourself as a DM with a lone wolf in your party, I encourage you to give your players some moments to let their characters connect. Sometimes it is as simple as letting them get drunk in a bar. Let them go on a quest to rid the tavern keeper of a pest problem, then drinks are on the house for the rest of the night. Then, let your party roleplay out drinking games, conversations, whatever. This will usually give your players, even the edgier characters, time and an opportunity to open up about their inevitable family issues and tragic backstories. If that still isn't enough, it may take some out-of-character discussion to get that player to connect more with the party. If their character refuses to open up and work with the party, it usually means that the player doesn't feel particularly comfortable with the group. Not all the time, of course, but I've usually found that to be the case. Once they feel like they're part of the party, things tend to smooth out and they're usually more willing to go along with the group. The final character I want to talk about is kind of a less extreme version of the murder hobo, one I like to call Sticky Fingers. As you can probably guess, this is the person who steals everything they see. And I don't just mean they try to swipe stuff from a shop here and there. I'm talking about the character that makes it a point to make a check almost daily to just wander around the town square and pickpocket everyone they see during the day and rob blind every magic shop within 100 miles at night. This character is super common from my experience, especially if you're running in a more urban setting, and it causes a lot of difficulties for a DM in a few different ways. First of all, it's hard enough to figure out the economy of a world. Pricing magic items is kind of a wild guess every time from my experience, and when your party has stolen thousands of gold over the course of a campaign, it suddenly becomes even more difficult. Not to mention when they start stealing magic items, it gives them additional power that you may not have intended to give. And of course, there's the matter of them getting caught stealing. I don't know about other GMs, but I really hate sending my characters to jail because it ends up being a bit of a derailment that the players will inevitably find their way out of, so it's more of just a roadblock than an actual meaningful plot point. So yeah, there are a lot of things about Sticky fingers that can cause issues within a campaign. I think the reasoning is pretty obvious though. Players like having powerful items and lots of money. That is the point of being an adventurer. So I guess the real question is how to combat this temptation. The short answer is you don't. As far as I know, there's no real way to make players not want to get a bunch of money and magic items, and I frankly don't think you should. Let your players pickpocket in the town square. Let them try to rob places but don't let them take over the session while they're doing it. I recommend making any pickpocket checks just a quick thing. Make them roll a sleight of hand check. If they roll low, they don't get anything. If they roll high, they get a little bit of gold. Keep in mind that commoners aren't going to be caught casually wandering around with an entire gold piece on them, so a day's worth of pickpocketing probably won't actually yield that huge of a payout. In regards to stealing from a shop, in particular a magic shop, those items are incredibly expensive, and a mage who spent several weeks and several hundred gold pieces enchanting them aren't going to just just leave them in a shop with a simple lock on the door. Take advantage of spells like Alarm, Arcane Lock, and Glyph of Warding to make it significantly more difficult for a rogue to casually break in and steal. Many mages also use familiars, so maybe they can have their familiar keep watch in the shop overnight. And if they end up making a lot of noise, it can alert some guards. You want to really find that line between making it challenging for your players and just punishing them for doing something that makes your job a bit more difficult. If they decide to give up and run off without any items, it may not be a bad idea to just let them get away. They failed. No need to punish them any further. I think you'll find it is much easier to accept this tendency and make it part of the game than it is to try and stop it from happening. And your players will likely end up being excited at the prospect of a challenging series of checks to get a magic item. Best case scenario, they work really hard and roll super well and end up with a magic item for it. 
Worst case scenario, they fail and have to try again another time. It ends up being fun for both the GM and the party and improves the game overall. All right, those are some of the biggest problem characters in my opinion and what I think are some logical solutions to them. Let me know in the comments if you think I missed any and how you may have solved these issues in your own campaigns. Next week's video, I'll be discussing some of the best monsters in D&D that I wish I got to see more. So if you have any suggestions, leave those in the comments as well. But until then, thank you all very much for watching and I'll see you around.